Thank you very much. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Peace and a very good morning to all. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for being here today. Let me begin by extending our gratitude to the government of Jordan for generously hosting this consultation and to the League of Arab States and the Organization for Islamic, of Islamic Cooperation for co-chairing this consultation. I would also like to express our gratitude to each of the members of the Regional Steering Group for their dedication and time over the past months to support this critical process. My thanks also go to the incredible team at the Ocha Regional Office for the Middle East and North Africa, led by Rima, who have done an incredible job in preparing for this important event and the many organizations in the region who have been actively engaged in the preparatory consultations. I am saddened that Dr. Hani Albana is unable to be here today but I would like to especially recognize his incredible personal commitment, dedication and energy and the humanitarian forum in leading many of the national consultations in the region. It is with these consultations with governments, local organizations and importantly affected people that we have the foundations of this important consultation here over the next few days. We are very grateful for the generous contributions from the League of Arab States, Al-Walid bin Talal Foundation, and the Government of Netherlands. Last but not least, this consultation would not be possible without your presence, and I'm delighted that representatives from all countries in this regional group are present. The actors in this region have an incredible amount of experience and knowledge to contribute. There is also an extraordinary amount of diversity in this room. I am pleased to see representatives from so many partners and sectors here today. Governments, regional organizations, civil society, humanitarian practitioners, private sector, and very importantly, people affected by crisis, all gathered here today. Tremendous efforts are made every day to save people's lives and alleviate suffering. But the international system has come under growing stress. In the past few decades, the humanitarian landscape has changed beyond recognition. An increasing number of crises demand ever greater resources. The needs consistently outpace our ability to respond. It has become clear that our approaches are outdated for dealing with today's humanitarian challenges, let alone those of the future. So how can we address humanitarian needs in a riskier, more unpredictable, resource-constrained world? How can we seize on new opportunities, leverage new technologies, and work with new actors? What changes are needed so that we can not only keep up, but get ahead? How can we save more lives? We have spent the last year asking humanitarian actors in each region of the world to think about these questions and propose solutions to these pressing issues. This is the fifth of eight regional consultations. While each consultation has had a different focus, the discussions are beginning to converge around six key issues. These ideas are by no means final, but are aimed at giving shape to solutions. Allow me to share some of the key issues we have heard so far. One, making affected people the prime agents of response by giving them a stronger voice and choice in how their needs are addressed and closing the gender gap. Two, localizing preparedness and response by responding to the strong call from countries, communities, and local organizations to manage risk and response by themselves, particularly natural disasters and rising crises in densely populated, often informal urban settlements. Three, building resilience to recurrent and protracted crises by forging an agreement between humanitarian and development sectors to minimize the impact of crises on development gains, shift from using humanitarian instruments for meeting chronic long-term needs, find solutions to protracted displacement and prepare for a rapidly urbanizing world. Four, reinforcing humanitarian action in conflict 
by confronting violations of international humanitarian law and finding new ways to ensure affected people have access to assistance and protection. Fifth, adjusting the international humanitarian system and finance by recalibrating it to deal with the different types and scales of, disaster, of crises, embracing the growing diversity of partners, tackling the finance gap, and focusing on urban risk. Six, creating the right conditions for innovation and other ch changes needed to get ready for the future by make, making this happen for all of the above. We are also concurrently consulting more widely through dedicated workshops and fora with the private sector, military actors, youth, women, and with faith-based leaders and organizations. We are leveraging on partners and networks to hold dialogues with youth, women, children, and people living with disabilities. We are expanding consultations and discussions with affected communities, and also robust ongoing discussions online. And we are benefiting from the research and policy work being contributed by organizations from around the world. The recommendations produced by all these consultations will be brought together in a synthesis report that will be discussed at the global consultation in October this year in Geneva. After the global consultation, a report of the Secretary General will lay out concrete proposals to take the recommendations forward at the summit and beyond. This will be circulated well in advance. In the next year, the outcomes from Sendai, the SDG summit, and the climate change discussions will create new frameworks for how we approach development. But humanitarian crises halt and sometimes even reverse development gains. They impede the delivery of development goals and have catastrophic effects on economic growth. Around the world, millions of people in fragile contexts and crisis-affected states are in danger of being left behind. These challenges are set to intensify in the future. The World Humanitarian Summit presents an opportunity to keep the needs of these women, men, boys and girls on the global agenda and to take steps towards a coherent approach to resilience. We must not let that opportunity pass us by. Let me say a few words about the summit itself. The dates have not yet been announced, but it is likely to take place in the third week of May 2016 in Istanbul. There will be representation from governments, multilateral organizations, the Red Cross and Red Crescent, NGOs and civil society, affected people, diaspora, the private sector, youth and academia. There are three key aspects of the summit. First, the World Humanitarian Summit is a unique and pivotal moment to focus the attention of the world on people in crisis. We must use it to reaffirm our commitment to humanity and to the fundamental principles that underpin our work. We must also use the summit as an opportunity to call for all parties to uphold their obligations to save lives, alleviate suffering, and uphold human dignity. Second, the summit is a historic opportunity to propose an agenda for change. It is a chance to recognize our successes and build on what is working, but also to recommend major changes to the current multilateral system. The consultations so far have emphasized that these changes should place the empowerment of and accountability to affected people at the core of all our work. They have called for greater flexibility so that we can adapt to different contexts, for a response that is locally led wherever possible and more inclusive of diverse actors. They have called for major changes to our financing system and how we must be more inclusive of local institutions and organizations. Each consultation so far has also called for us to take serious steps to bridge the humanitarian development divide and build resilience to protracted and recurrent crises and to address the deficit in preparedness. In conflicts, we must find better ways to meet the people's needs for security, dignity, and hope. Finally, Istanbul should not be a talk shop, but should focus on action and setting a future agenda. It is an opportunity to launch innovative partnerships and initiatives and demonstrate support 
for the recommended changes. As this is a non-intergovernmental process, many questions have been raised and many are keen to know what the outcomes will be. But this unique, inclusive, bottom-up approach allows everyone to have a voice at the table. Some of the final recommendations may be implemented quickly and some may require to be taken up through ensuing intergovernmental discussions. This region, I hope, will share its uniqueness that can contribute to the recommendations. For example, how do we protect and scale up life-saving cash programs and transfer? What is the role of zakat, awqaf, and Islamic social finance more broadly to address finance gaps? How do we really break the humanitarian development divide and silos and achieve a more joined up approach to risks and vulnerabilities, particularly on protracted crises in this region? What really needs to happen to address insurmountable challenges faced by people in conflict as well as the people who are trying to have access to them? We must also not wait until Istanbul to begin acting on the recommendations that have arisen from this region. This consultation should mark the beginning of your continued engagement in preparations for the World Humanitarian Summit, and not the end. When you leave here, I urge you to go back to your respective governments, organizations, and communities, and suggest ways that the recommendations can be taken forward. Let me share an example. Our regional consultation for Eastern and Southern Africa sparked a discussion between UN agencies, a private sector company, and the government of Madagascar. When they returned to Madagascar, they set up a new disaster platform to coordinate private sector contributions to humanitarian response. When the recent flooding hit, this was successfully applied. I have often said that the process leading to the summit is just as important as the summit itself. This regional consultation has already supported the strengthening of partnerships at the national, regional, and international levels. From the high-level roundtables in Kuwait in October last year, to national consultations, to focus groups with affected communities, the process has brought together representatives from governments, the NGOs, to discuss issues of common concern. It has also highlighted the important contribution, contributions of actors who are outside the formal humanitarian system, including businesses, the diaspora networks, and host communities. It has underscored the generous, innovative, and resilient spirit of the people of this region. I urge you to bring this spirit into our discussions as we now search for solutions to our most pressing challenges. Over the next two and a half days, you will have the chance to discuss in depth our challenges and our strengths. I urge you to keep your conversations solidly focused on the search for recommendations and proposed solutions. After each consultation, stakeholders have demanded bolder recommendations from the World Humanitarian Summit Secretariat. These recommendations must come from you. We must keep looking ahead and discuss as frankly as possible the changes that are needed. No idea is too small. No suggestion is too bold. Distinguished guests and participants, this MENA regional consultation is very important to me in so many ways. At a very personal level, I have worked in almost all the countries in this region in my career and experienced firsthand the challenges faced by people caught in conflict and disasters in this region that is facing serious conflict in a world that has displaced more people in history since World War II. As a secretariat, this is the consultation we have been counting on to really hone in on finding solutions to better serve the needs of people in conflict. It is imperative that we have frank discussions that result in some bold, aspirational, concrete ideas and recommendations to take forward to the summit. We are, after all, at the Dead Sea. I am sure your good recommendations will be kept afloat at the summit. The millions of people affected by crises and disasters around the world deserve a better future. The World Humanitarian Summit is a golden opportunity to propose and implement changes that will lead to better outcomes for affected people. We must not let them down and I count on all of us here to put our best efforts to find some solutions which we can take to Istanbul. 
Shukran Jazila. Thank you very much, and I look forward to the next few days with you. Assalamualaikum.